Hi, everybody, and a very pleasant good evening to you, wherever you may be. Lucky Strikes blowing smoke rings at you from the studios of Comfortably Zone Radio. And it's time for Dodgers baseball, a tale of two cities, from Brooklyn to Los Angeles. I'm your host, Peter Trunk, and my co-host is Ron Rabinovitz. Ron, how you doing? How tonight? you doing, Peter? I'm good. How I'm are doing, you doing fine. Man? Doing fine. Great. Doing good fine. Good to, good to hear your voice. Another show. Thank you. Good to hear your Thank voice. Thank you. Uh, I, I heard that you were um, busy talking to some more uh, school children. I was today. Yes. Yeah. Where at? I've been to Target at Target Field. Oh, good. And uh, I just uh, this was a, uh, a, a Lutheran church. And uh, they were great kids, a lot of uh-huh. good questions. It was fabulous. So we had a great That's time. Good. That's yeah, good. it was fun. That's good. So Anytime I he... can teach about diversity, bullying, yeah, yep, and Jackie Robinson, I'll yep. talk about it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I, there's no doubt about it. How long do your uh, talks last? Uh, depends on the audience. If like today it was just little kids. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, and then I also show uh, part of that Letters from Jackie DVD. Right. But today, like, uh, for the little kids, we just did the PowerPoint. So that was fine. And a lot of questions after that. So that was good. Oh, yeah? Good questions. I read them a couple. Yeah, good questions. And I I read them a couple of excerpts from a couple of letters from Jackie. And uh, we took some pictures and... Then they went on their way to the rest of the tour of Target Field. Oh, good. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's really yeah, good. I love it. I, I'm great. with the yeah. twins there. It must be 30, 35 times a year. Wow. Call me in for that. Isn't that nice? That is very it's nice. It's a nice little gig. Yeah, I love That's it. Very nice. And they're great people. Great people. Uh-huh. Yeah. When the uh, – I had – Did it – did the Dodgers play in Minnesota this year or last year? No, they uh, the, the the Twins played in L.A. Oh, okay. And we swept them. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> you know. Huh? Fortunately, I don't have to. Uh, I can still be a Dodger fan and don't have to worry about the Twins most of the time. Right. But, exactly. Uh, if we recall, after that three-game sweep in L.A., that's when they took a nosedive. But they're coming back. They're coming back. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. How, how many? So, uh, they're in the running. They're in the running for the wild card, right? They're in the hunt for the wild card. Yes, they are. Okay. Definitely. So that would uh, be interesting. Yeah. 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 I had a wonderful I, I, experience. Oh, go ahead. Uh-huh. No, I check the. Uh, I check the wild card every now and then. I don't check it every day, uh-huh. but I check yeah. it every now and then, and I see who's close and who isn't. I will tell you this. Uh, a few weeks ago, the um, Arizona Diamondbacks and the Colorado Rockies were a lock in the National League. I now, think they still are. Not so much. They were like well, 10 games. The, uh, Arizona was like 10 games ahead for, uh-huh. for the uh, wild card. Now they're like two. Really? Okay. Yeah. I, I wasn't a real uh, realize that. I can check it real quick right, right now. I'll just check it out. I'll tell you in a second what's going uh-huh. on. Um, wild card. Okay. In the National League, uh, wild card, Colorado and uh, Arizona. And Milwaukee's three and a half games out. Oh, three and a half. They must have lost. Three and a half. Arizona must have won, yeah. And then three and a half. It was two and a half last half. night before yeah. the games, right? It's three and a half now. And then okay. uh, Aaron, uh, St. Louis is four and a half. And Miami six. All right. So. You got, you got the yeah. American League numbers there? Sure, I do. Um, hold on. The Yankees, of course, and Minnesota are the one, two. With uh, okay. the Angels a half a game out. Wow. Seattle a game out. And Kansas City a game and a half. And Texas two games. So it's That's really close. close there. That's very, very close. close. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was at a – I spoke last week at Target Field. And Dave St. Peter, who was the president of the Twins, he was in a meeting. And I was talking to him after the meeting. 
and they were talking about uh, playoffs and wild cards and, you know, ticket prices yeah. and all those things. So they're getting uh-huh. prepared just in case. They have to. Oh, sure. So, yeah, so that was exciting. That was yeah, exciting. you have to be prepared. Yeah, have that's to be right. Prepared. So. Yep, you never I know. I had a very Baseball, interesting weekend. This, this past weekend, I had a very interesting weekend, Peter. It was uh, the, the St. Paul Saints which at one time was the Dodgers minor league uh, AAA club. Absolutely. They they're in they're in a um in another league now. They're they're um not sure what you it's a semi pro league now. And the Saints have a beautiful stadium over in St. Paul. And they had a Roy Campanella weekend which Great. was just wonderful. Honoring Roy Campanella because he played for the Saints. Yes, he did. Um, before Not only he did he play up, for the Saints, he was the first black guy in that league. He was. That's right, in the American Association. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, Broke the color line. Uh, Bob Kendr- Kendrick was there from the Negro Baseball Museum. Oh, he's We've a great had guy. Bob on our show. He's a great guy. Great. And Frank White, who's a wonderful man, he's in charge of the RBI program here in the Twin Cities, and he works for the Twins. Is that so they had this Frank White up. who played second base for them? No, no, no. I think he was in Kansas City, that Frank White. Oh, okay. That's right. This Frank White. My mistake. My mistake. That's okay. He was a catcher. And I think we had Frank on our show one time, but possibly it was on our Sunday show. But I'm not sure about that. And then um, his best friend is Steve Winfield. That's Dave's brother. Uh So he was there. Uh, Steve was there. He's a very dear friend of mine, too. And we had a good time. And then... Sunday, they had a ceremony out on the field honoring Roy Campanella, and uh, Bob Kendrick was out there, and we had a great time. So I thought maybe it would be fitting to uh, stay in that mode and, and talk a little bit about Campy tonight. Sure. Sure, okay. absolutely. I loved Campy. Campy was the greatest oh, he was great. Ever. He was great. Yep. Yeah. Well, to start out, he was a star both – in the on the bat in the bat on the bat and on the glove, he was an agile behind the plate, and he was an expert handler of pitchers. He was born in 1921 in Philadelphia, and Cappy began playing semi-pro baseball with the Bacharach Giants when he was just 15 years old. Mm-hmm. His playing ability caught the eye of the Baltimore Elite Giants of the Negro League, and when he turned 16. He quit high school to focus on baseball full-time. After eight years in the Negro National League, Campy was signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers to a minor league contract in 1945. He spent two years in their minor league system before earning a spot on the Dodgers' major league roster. He appeared in three games for Brooklyn and was sent to the St. Paul Saints of the American Association then the AAA affiliate to the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. When Campy joined the club in 48, he became the first African-American player in the American Association and for the Saints. During his time with the Saints, Campy uh, hit 13 home runs with a .325 batting average and a .715 slugging average in just 35 games. In just 35 games. These uh, games were, these numbers were so impressive that uh, he was called up in 1948. And during his rookie season, Campy led the National League catchers in percentage of runs caught stealing. In 49, he was selected to the National League All-Star team, along with Brooklyn Dodger Jackie Robinson. Campy would be selected to the All-Star team in each of the next seven years. Amazing. The accolades accolades continued to accumulate for Campy. In 1951, he was named the most valuable player of the National League, hitting 325 with 33 home runs and 108 RBIs. Two years later, he was the first African-American player ever to win two MVP titles. Mm -hmm. And after earning the honor again in 1953 and in 1955. So it was amazing. And in 1955, of course, 
they beat those damn Yankees and became the world champs. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, well, Ronnie, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, I think Lifetime, I could be wrong on this, but I think I'm right. I think Campanella still holds the percentage of runners thrown out. He does. Stealing. He does. Yeah. Yeah. Does. That's quite an accomplishment. And, uh, amazing. Uh, 57.4%. Oh, man. Which is the best in the history of baseball. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. 57.4%. And he That's played for amazing. 10 years. 10 years he played. And uh, over that 10-year period, uh, he hit 242 home runs with an 856 RBIs. Um, and then that remarkable record of uh, catching base runners, 57.4%, which is still the best in the major league. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. He was quite a guy. He was quite he a guy. And he could, and he, they were very, he was very the best catcher I ever saw. He, oh, he me used too. to throw guys out from his crouch. He used to be down on one knee. He'd from catch his ball. Rock. That's right. Right. He'd catch, he'd, he'd like, it was amazing. He would backhand the ball, and right. from down there, he wouldn't even get up. He would just throw the guy out at second base. Throw the guy out. like a right. laser. Like a cannon. Like a laser. He had a cannon of an arm. Right, exactly. Man, oh, man. And he was tremendous with the pitchers. He knew yeah. their psych. He knew the psychology of the pitchers. Well, Nukem he was could, confident. could get lazy once in a while. Yeah, so he was confident all, about all that, that, too. He'd get them all mad, and then he'd yep. start pitching good again. And, yep. I mean, each pitcher is different. Their personalities are different. And he knew how who to kick in the butt and who to pat on the back. He was he amazing say, that way. He used to say to the Brooklyn pitchers, if you just listen to what I tell you to do, everything right. is going to be fine. Right. You shake me off, you're going to get in trouble. And, you know, so yeah. this, he was right. He was right, exactly. He was right. Unfortunately, he had a terrible car accident oh, in man. January of 1958, and he ended up uh, uh, paralyzed from the neck down. He was forced to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair, but that didn't stop him. No, it Because he continually went to Vero Beach to spring training to teach the catchers and the pitchers. They used to have seminars. It was called Campy's Corner. And he would talk to the kids and teach them. He was amazing. And then, of course, they had in, I think it was in 1959, at the Coliseum, they yeah. had the largest crowd ever at a baseball game in Los Angeles. It was 109,000, maybe? It was no, 90, 90, 93, 93, 93 or something 000. like that, I think it was, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, in later years, the Dodgers... The Dodgers played the Boston Red Sox like in 2007 at the yeah. Coliseum where uh -huh. both teams only used two outfielders because they didn't move the left field out. It was only 201 feet with a 60-foot fence. Yeah. But they, yeah. they announced that crowd at 115,300. They, yeah. they did seat people <laughs> on the field for that that game yes, they did. beyond, they beyond did. the right field uh, fence, but I don't right, see right. how they could fit 115,300. I think that that number was a little weird, but Probably yeah, can't be had like 92, 93,000. It was a lot <laughs> of people, boy. And everybody lit lighters or matches. It was amazing. There was pictures of yeah, all. Yeah, they turned people. the lights out and they did that, right? Right, right, in honor of him. Yeah. It was pretty good. They, they uh, played the Yankees that night. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Pee, -wee the next Reese rolled them out. Pee Wee Reese rolled them out in a wheelchair. <laughs> yeah. That's right. The festivities. Yeah. That's right. It was so great. And then in, um, his number was retired by the Dodgers. He was one of the first three numbers to be retired. It was him, uh, Jackie Robinson, and Sandy Koufax. Exactly. They, they all went in. This was in 1958. Uh, no, it was later. Yeah, it was sure later. It was Dodger that. Stadium. It was a Dodger right, Stadium. Right. Yeah. Right. And then right. Campy was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1969. Right. 
And three years later, in 72, he was honored by retiring his number 39, along with number 32 and number 42. There you go. And it was the first three Dodgers that were retired. So it's pretty good. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty damn good. And I had a wonderful time. Pretty damn good. You know, some people you who bet. didn't live, people who weren't alive or, or old enough to follow the Dodgers back then, well, they and I've had this happen with me uh, more than a few times. They say, well, he yeah. had good years, and then he would have a bad year, and then he would have a good year, and then he would have a bad yeah. year, and then he would have a good year, and then he would have a bad year. I said, you don't understand the background. <laughs> On that, right. he had he had surgeries on his fingers and his hands, right? And that's right. why he couldn't even grip a bat. That's he right. couldn't even grip a that's bat right. on those off years. Uh, you know, it like was in 1956. He chose right. to undergo it, surgery to relieve right. pain in his left yep. hand. Mm-hmm. He missed more than 50 games, and then the, the next season he failed to make the All Star team. Right. Which was too bad because that was his last season. Yeah, it was. But he caught yeah, nearly 1,200 games. I mean, well, imagine 1,200 games plus all the games he caught in the Negro Leagues. He and catch a four in a game every day. Yeah, they play. That's right. They play double and triple and quadruple headers. Yeah. And he started catching in 50, at 15, so you yeah. can imagine how his hand had to be uh, pretty broken up after oh, all those catches. You know. What a guy. <clears throat> Unbelievable. Yeah, and he Bob always had Patrick a smile. Telling me a story. Yeah. Always had a Bob smile. Kendrick, the glass always, was always half always, full. Always. With all his tragedy, he was it was always half full. He yep. was a lovely, lovely man. I met him a, a couple of times with, with Jackie. Uh, uh-huh. He was so gracious and so nice. Just a wonderful guy. Now, yeah, Bob Kendrick was telling Yeah. He was telling me about a couple of Negro League catchers that never made it to the National League or the American League. Um, one of them, of course, was Josh Gibson, who was a tremendous, tremendous catcher. And then there was another one. I forget the guy's name, but he said he had an arm like you cannot believe. From home plate, he could throw a ball over the center field wall <laughs> from home plate. <laughs> I don't remember the guy's name. but. Unbelievable. He was telling us stories the other day. It was so much fun listening to him. Because he used to travel with Buck O'Neill. Yeah, Buck, Buck O'Neill. would tell all these stories. And uh, just, Buck O'Neill had the greatest stories in oh, the world. Yeah, and Bob just kind of, it was like a sponge. He just absorbed it all. He, yeah. he was his driver. He was his driver, and he listened to him. And now he tells those wonderful stories. He's a marvelous guy. Isn't he nice? He's a nice oh, guy. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. He very, was, very interesting, too, when he talks. We're very dear friends. Yeah, very dear friends. Yeah. Very interesting He's a guy. great guy. Yeah. He came um, to the Twin Cities this weekend, and he met with Dave Peter of the Twins because he wants the team as a whole, next time they're playing in Kansas City, that the whole team should come down to that Negro League Museum to see it, which would be a terrific idea. And give some history lessons to all these kids. Sure, because it's really in a, it's really a tremendous museum. If you ever get a chance to go there, I've yeah. been there several times. It, it, there's history among history among history. It's really terrific. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so so that's it. So I'll let you uh, talk a little bit. I think you're going to talk well, about you know, Dodgers. I had a. I had an interesting thing happen to me yesterday. I was in the bank with Linda, the local bank, and I had mm-hmm. on my uh, had on my uh, Dodger T-shirt. I always wear something that says Dodgers. Yeah. Name. And I saw this older guy at the next uh, booth, and he turned around to starting to leave the bank, and he caught a glimpse of my T-shirt, and he <laughs> and he stopped. And this happens to yeah. me all the time. Whenever I wear my Dodger stuff, when I wear yeah. my Brooklyn stuff to the to the to, to the market or to the mall or to the uh-huh. bank or wherever, I'm always <laughs> engaged in conversation. And this was no different. And the guy stopped in his tracks and he said, "Dodgers." He said, 
Brooklyn Dodgers? And I said, of course, Brooklyn Dodgers. And he said, oh, he said, I was born in Brooklyn. I said, so was I. So he said, yeah, but I was born and raised in Brooklyn, but I was a Giants fan. I said, you were a Giants fan? Yeah, Yeah, that's what I said. I said, the only time I ever heard about that was uh, Joe Torrey. Joe Torrey right. was born in Brooklyn, and he was a Giants fan. I said, right. how did you survive? And he starts laughing and stuff. It turns out, I'm talking to this guy for like a half an hour. Linda's yeah. rolling her eyes, and she's sitting down <laughs> waiting for me and tapping her foot and everything. And we're talking and talking about Ebbets Field and the polo grounds and Sal Nagley and Jackie Robinson and everything. It turns out that this guy used to work at the Carnegie Deli in New York. No. Oh, yeah? That's what he did. That's what he did for no a living. Kidding. Okay? No kidding. And he, he oh. said everybody came in there. He said Willie Mays came in there. The oh, Rogers sure, they all did. There. The, oh, yeah. You name it. He said, forget the movie stars. All the Giants and yeah. the Dodgers, they right. all came in there. They used to all he said, and, I, and I was a big baseball fan, and I used to talk to all yeah. of them and stuff. So the yeah. guy, I could tell by the way he was talking to me. And this happens yeah. sometimes. Uh-huh. The guy, as he's talking to me, I could tell he gets a little smirk on his face, and he thinks this guy, meaning me, this guy really doesn't know his stuff. I'm going to ask him a few questions. Yeah. So he, start, he starts to ask me a few questions. He goes, in 1951 playoff, and I said, oh, don't mention that. I said, that, hurts, that still hurts me, and I hold my chest. And he goes, in the third game, who is the winning pitcher? And I said, Larry Jansen. And he said, everybody says Sal Magley. I said, no, 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 no. Sal Magley was, was he, he, he left, the Dodgers were winning 4-1 to one when he left the uh-huh. game. Jansen got to win. He said, yeah, you're right, you're right. He said, who was on deck with Thompson and Thomas? And I said, no, nah, nah, that's too easy. I said, Willie Mays, of course. I said, who pinch, pinch ran for Don Mueller when he broke his ankle sliding in the third he couldn't get it. I said, Clint Hartung. And I said, the reason Clint Hartung, the Rocher put Clint Hartung to, to be the pinch runner was because at the time, Newcomb was still in the game. He didn't know that he was going to get taken out. And he had been yelling and cursing and mocking Newcomb the entire day to try to get under his skin. And he thought that the game was going to be over, and he wanted Clint Hartung. Clint Hartung was six foot seven. Uh-huh. And huh. DeRosha was coaching third base. Sure. But he needed a buffer. So yeah. he got the the largest guy on the roster to pinch run for Mueller. So when the game was over, if Newcomb thought about coming and grabbing him by the throat, he had yeah. Clint Hartung to, to be his right. bodyguard. And that's right. why Hartung pinch ran. Because <laughs> Hartung couldn't run couldn't run a lick. He was six foot seven. No. Yeah. No, and anyway, he starts asking me all these other questions and stuff, and yeah. and then I could see his face, his facial expression changed, uh-huh. and he said, I could see that he was saying something to himself like, "I've met my match with this guy. This guy knows, every, <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't stump the guy." You know, he, yeah. he asked me like fifteen questions before oh he got the God. questions out of his mouth. I was giving him the answers, <laughs> and these were all New York Giants questions. Right. Right. Like I said, he's a New York Giants fan, and he's asking me all these questions, and I I told him all these. And, you know, he never heard that uh, when DeRocher went to the Giants in 48, he wanted to trade for Branca, and he wanted to Uh trade Bobby Thompson, and that the Giants and the Dodgers were were initially discussing a trade, Branca for Bobby Thompson, and wouldn't that have changed the whole world. As Would that know. have changed the whole world? Yeah, uh, just crazy, crazy stuff. One thing that's but anyway, interesting. Is that then, then we here. bid farewell. I asked them to be a, I asked them to be a, um, a guest on our show. Oh, great! And he didn't great. know. He didn't. He he didn't. He didn't know want to do it. He didn't want to do it. He's about. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take a guess that he was uh-huh. about 84, 83, okay. 84, and he okay. wasn't computer savvy. He didn't know anything yeah. about Comfortably Zone Radio. He didn't know anything what a podcast was. He didn't sure, know what, a, sure. what, a, what an internet radio show was and everything. So I didn't right. want to push it. I didn't want to push no, it, so no. I let him go. That's right. But he would have been sure, a, a hell of a guest, I'll tell you. He would have been great. He would have been yeah, great. Yeah, he would have been a hell of a guest. Absolutely. Hell of a guest. 
He probably didn't have an iPhone or anything, so. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, no, forget yeah. that. Forget it. So, you know, he was anyway. something very interesting that a lot of our listeners wouldn't have known, that DeRocher was the third base coach and the manager. Oh, and sure. In those days, the manager was a third base coach. They didn't sit in the dugout. They they were on the exactly. field. And that yeah, was a cost-cutting. Yeah, I remember. That was a cost-cutting maneuver Jackie by Robinson, the club. Yeah. When Jackie Robinson was honored in Cincinnati in 1972, on the 25th anniversary of his breaking the color line, he yep. made a statement. He said, thank you very much, but I won't be happy until I see a black face on that third base coaching line, meaning the manager or Absolutely. African-American general manager. That's what he meant. And That's what he meant when he said on the third base line. Right. And I, I tell my kids and grandkids that the manager used to be the third. And they can't believe it. They cannot yeah. believe it. Uh-huh. They sure were. Yeah. Yeah. In many Pretty instances, amazing. they were. In many, yes, many they were. instances, they were. Um, I was reading something the other day on the beach when I was on vacation about um, Carlos Ken's first no-hitter. Uh-huh. Now, all us Dodger fans, we all know that Erskine pitched two no-hitters, the first one in right. 1952 against the Cubs and then against the hated Giants. 1956, yeah. and he pitched them both right. at Ebbets Field. Pitched them both. Right. They were both day games. And but anyway, I was reading about the 1952 Erskine no hitter. Now you know, Duke uh-huh. Snyder and Carl Erskine were fast friends. They lived right. uh, by each other in Bay Ridge, in uh-huh. Brooklyn, and they were roomies on the road. And you know, they they were just very close. And Snyder very likes close. to tell a story. Snyder likes to tell a story about the 1952 no hitter that Erskine pitched uh-huh. at its field against the Cubs. And it was a cloudy, windy day. And, in fact, in the third inning, the umpires called time, and they put the tarp out on the field, and the Dodgers and the Cubs went back into their respective clubhouses. And Snyder says they started playing bridge. They were playing uh-huh. cards and everything. They thought the game was going to be uh-huh. rained out. But lo and behold, the umpire stuck his head into the clubhouse and said, on the field, the tarp's coming off. We're going to resume. Huh. And uh, so they went back out, not like today where you switch pitchers, went back sure, out sure. and went back to the mound, and he's huh. pitching, and he uh, he's pitching a no-hitter. Now, the only guy that made uh, first base, he walked. And believe it uh-huh. or not, he walked the relief pitcher, Willie, Willie huh. Ramsdell. Willie Ramsdell, oh Willie Ramsdell was not only a relief pitcher, of uh, ill repute, but he was a knuckleball yeah. guy, uh-huh. and he um, he 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 never made big money. He was never a winner. He was just right. a regular guy, you know, like a a blue collar. Uh-huh. I guess you'd call him a blue sure, collar sure. guy. And anyway, yeah. he gets up to to bat as a, he came in relief of uh, Warren Hacker. Warren Hacker okay. was the starting pitcher for the Cubs, and Ramsdale comes in in relief, and he walks. I think it was the third or fourth inning. It was pretty early in the game. And he walked. Yeah. He, of course, he dies at first base because Erskine's pitching a no-hitter. And sure. toward the end of the game, towards the end of the game, Happy Felton, we all know Happy Felton. Right, right. Happy Felton at the time in 1952 had a Dodgers post-game show. Uh-huh. Okay, post-game show called uh, Talk to the Stars. Okay. Okay. That was his. That was his uh, TV show after Dodger home games. Uh, Happy Felton talked to the stars. So, huh. as the game is as the game's progressing, and everybody in the place knows that the no hitter is going on. Uh, Ramsdell gets taken out of the game for a pinch hitter, and another Cub pitcher comes in. And with that, uh-huh. Happy Felton runs down to the Cubs clubhouse and goes inside and he says to Ramsdale, Willie, Willie, don't take your uniform off. Don't take your uniform off. I want you to be on my post-game show because if Erskine follows through and gets this no-hitter, you will have been the only base runner of the game Right. in that you walked. So yeah. you come on my show. 
And now there's a fifty dollar fee. You go on the show, you yeah. make fifty bucks. In those right. days, fifty bucks. Those days, that was a lot money. of money. Right, fifty bucks was fifty bucks, baby. You know. <laughs> yeah. So Ramsdale, Ramsdale goes, yeah, 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 sure. He puts his cap <laughs> back on. He buttons his shirt back up, and they walk over to the Dodger outside the Dodger clubhouse, underneath the stands at uh, Ebbets Field, where the little tiny TV studio. And they're watching uh-huh. the rest of the game. They're watching the ninth inning on a little black and white TV in the studio as they're waiting for the game to be over. Now there's right. two outs in the, in, the, in the top of the ninth inning, two outs, and the Cubs are sending up Eddie Mixus. Eddie Mixus is going to be the last batter if Erskine can get him out. And Ramsdell will make his $50 and be on the postgame show. So Happy Felton tells the story to Duke Snyder. He says, you never saw anything like it, Duke. He goes, here's Willie Ramsdell in his full Cubs uniform, including his cap, and he's yelling at the TV, mix this, you son of a bitch. Don't get a hit now. Don't get a hit now. Whatever you do, don't get a hit now. Okay? So, of course, Erskine gets, gets rid of mix this. He, he He gets him out, and he's got the no-hitter. And that's how Willie Ramsdell made his fifty dollars on the post game show uh, as being the only Cub baseman. I thought that was hilarious. That's that a hilarious so story, that's and it only shows what fifty bucks meant back in the day. That's right. It was a lot of money. Absolutely, Buck, baby. It was a that lot of so money. Funny. Believe me. Hey, Peter, do you money. happen to know how long that that break was when Erskine had to go into the dressing room? I don't. I don't, but you know I'm not a card player. No. But Snyder says, Snyder says that when they came in on the uh, break, some, yeah. somebody yelled out Clyde King, or somebody yelled out Deal him, Deal him. The Dodgers were big, big card players, and yes, they were. They 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 played many games. One of them was bridge, and they were playing uh-huh. bridge. Now I'm not a bridge player. You might be no, a bridge I'm player. I'm not. I'm not. But no, I'm Snyder not. Snyder recalls. That another twist to the story was just when Carl Erskine gets four hearts, <laughs> the umpire put his head back in and said, okay, the tarp's coming off, let's go. So evidently that's a big deal, and, you know, that yeah. he was going to win some money doing that, but they, yeah. called, they, they called him back. Now, I remember, <laughs> I remember when I interviewed Carl Erskine two years yeah. ago, he told me that story, and he, he spoke to me. Yes, he, he told me that story, and he spoke to me. He didn't tell me about the Ramsdell thing. He told me yeah. that he had four hearts and that the umpire <laughs> just put his head back in and said, okay, game's back on, the, the tarp's coming off, let's go, fellas. And uh, he, he didn't get to finish that game, and he would have won some money. That was his story. Be- Snyder's story included that, but it also included the Willie Ramsdell making the $50 to appear on Happy Felton's post-game show and rooting against his own player uh, not to get a hit so he could make the 50 bucks. To get the 50 bucks. (laughs) That's funny. That is a funny, funny story. It would be interesting to find out how long of a break that was. I really don't know. I really don't know. It was cool. I don't know. You know. Yeah. Uh Yeah. But in those days, they warmed up again. They didn't. Today they, they didn't you care. Out. They just came out and uh, did what they had to do. <laughs> That's yeah. Such a different game, man. Snyder tells a lot of funny stories. Oh, he Snyder tells the story. Snyder told the story that uh, Walker Cooper. Walker Cooper was uh-huh. a Giants, uh, New York Giants catcher. Okay. He didn't hit. Didn't hit for much average, but he could hit the long ball. He was a big, strong guy. Uh-huh. And okay. his nickname for Duke. Snyder, he used to call Duke uh, third of a dozen because Snyder wore number four. Right. Because he wore number four on his uniform. Sure, so sure. he called him, hey, third of a dozen. Third of a dozen. <laughs> he used to call Snyder third of a dozen. And Snyder thought that was cute. And he also showed him he also showed him that the padding, you know how catchers used to put, a, back in the day, they used to put a sponge in the glove. Right. You know, to, to uh, guard against the, their hand being damaged Injured, right. and bruised mm-hmm. with all the fastballs that they had to sure. catch. Now the right. gloves are different now, all totally right. different. 
back in those totally days, different. you caught the ball right in the pocket of the glove, That's and right. you needed a That's sponge right. or whatever. I know Camden yeah. had a sponge, too. But yeah, Walker exactly. Cooper showed Snyder what he used for a sponge, and it was a woman's falsy. No. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Isn't that oh, funny? That's a funny story. That's and, a uh, funny story. Another funny story. <laughs> uh, Branca, Ralph Branca, tells the story that uh, you remember when Bobby Valentine was. I don't know if you remember this because you're not a New York. You're not from New York, so you weren't watching New York Mets no. games. But this no. made MLB and the week that was, and this was the you know this week in baseball. It was a big, famous thing. Back in the day when Bobby Valentine, who happens to be or happens to have been since Ralph is no longer with us, he was Ralph Branca's son-in-law. He married Branca's daughter. Okay. Okay. Anyway, Bobby Valentine was the manager of the Mets, and he gets into this really heavy argument with the home plate umpire. Okay. And he says the magic word, I guess, and the home plate. Home plate umpire throws him out of the game. (laughs) So Bobby Valentine is thrown out of the game as the Mets manager. But later on, the camera catches a guy in a windbreaker with a fake mustache and an umpire's cap on, sitting at the end of the bench with his arms folded. And sure enough, it was was Valentine. Valentine (laughs) Valentine came back on the bench trying to pretend that, you know, and the umpire caught him. He was fined and suspended. The whole oh, deal. I, he I mean, he got in a lot of trouble. This was like 1999. I'm talking yeah. like 1999 yeah. or 2000, one of those years. Yeah. Yeah. He got in a lot of trouble. He was a that. character, Bobby. He was a he character. He was. He wasn't a but, great ball player himself, but he was a great Yeah, player. until he broke his leg. Yeah, but, exactly. But exactly. Branca tells the story of Charlie Dressen. He said, uh-huh. Charlie Dressen, shit. He says, Charlie Dressen did that many years before Valentine. Really? A half a century. A half a century yeah. before Valentine. He says, in 51, Dressen is arguing with the umpire, and the umpire throws okay. him out of the game. <laughs> and he gets back in the Dodger clubhouse, and he gets one of the uh, grounds crew guys who wore uh-huh. a navy blue shirt and pants with black shoes right. and a navy blue hat, and he got into the pants and the shoes and the shirt and the hat, and he put on a fake mustache, and he came back, and he's <laughs> in the Dodger dugout. Now, Brecca says grounds crew people were always in our dugout. So if the umpire yeah. looked over and saw a grounds crew guy in there, he wasn't going to say anything. But, in fact, yeah. it, was the, it was Dressen. It was Dressen. And Dressen managed – he said, Dressen managed the rest of the game, pitch for pitch, in that groundskeeper's uniform, standing at the end of the dugout. It never got he did that in 1951. How's that? Is that great or what? <laughs> so funny. So funny. That is, that is That's good. so funny. Yeah. Snyder, Snyder also tells the story. Duke had a lot of them. A lot of stories. Oh, he was great. He oh, was so boy. Funny. Snyder tells the story that after the 1950 season, when the Phillies beat the Dodgers on the last day of the season, when right. when Snyder got the hit and Abrams was thrown out at home plate, and then Dick Sisler hit the home run in the tenth inning to win the game, and the Dodgers had to go home. Do, uh, Duke Snyder um, uh, barnstormed after the fifty season. He, okay. and during the barnstorming, they went through Montreal, up in Montreal, uh-huh. and the general manager at Montreal when Snyder played there and still in 1950 was Buzzy Bavese. And Buzzy Bavese said to him, you know, I just want to congratulate you. This is before the game down during batting practice. Bavese comes Mm -hmm. onto the field and he says, I want to congratulate you on the fabulous season you had. You hit Mm -hmm. 300, you scored over 100 runs. It was just really, really great, you know. He said, now listen, do yourself a favor. Don't be a fool. You, when they send you your new uh, contract, uh-huh. you tell them you want double your salary. I think I think 
Duke was making like seventy five hundred. He says, "You ask for fifteen grand, you double, you double your salary, and don't take no for an answer." You know, now that's all well and good. Here's that. In 1951, Branch Rickey is gone. Who does O'Malley bring up as the general manager is Buzzy Bavese. Yeah. So Buzzy Bavese mails out Snyder's contract out to California, and it's for a modest raise from 7,500 to like 10 grand or something like that. Snyder writes a note on it. This doesn't look like double to me. And without signing it, of course, and nails it back to Bavese. <laughs> Bavese says, you son of a bitch, you have a good memory. <laughs> and he got the, he got the double. He, he got, by the way, moral of the story, he got, he got the, the double. double. He got the double of the money. He doubled his salary. Well, he earned it. Did it. He was a hell of a ball. Yeah. yeah, he sure oh, was. Yeah. Was he ever. So, oh, he was so fun. Boy. Hey, should we talk a little bit about the L.A. Dodgers, though? Yeah, we'll talk about the L.A. Dodgers. I have one more thing okay. that I read that I... Okay, go ahead. It, Please do. It boggled my mind because when I read this, I said to myself, am I reading this right? And I read it again, and then I read it again. Then I went in the okay. kitchen and I got myself a Gatorade, opened up the Gatorade, and I said, that can't be true. I said, but I don't have time to research it because i got to get on the, I gotta get on the show with uh, Ronnie, and uh, yeah. I'll ask Ronnie if he knows if this is true or not. Um, Branca, Ralph Branca roomed with Gil Hodges at least right. for a few years, okay, on yes, the road as players. Uh-huh. And uh, Hodges, when he managed the Mets, right. Branca had full reign going in there. You know, he could go in, you know, he, he had a pass. He could go in any time he sure. wanted, Branca. He'd go into right. Gill's office, have a beer, whatever, sit down, bullshit with him, talk to him, and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, Branca claims. Branca claims. Now here's here's the thing. Branca claims that it was Gil Hodges who came up with the five man rotation, pitching rotation. Really? He and Rube Walker came up with it, and they asked Branca what he thought of it. And Branca said, "It's not good. It's not it's not going to work." And I'll tell you why it's not going to work. He said, you only have three good pitchers. You have Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, and Gary Gentry. It's all you have. He says, well, he says, the way Rube and I look at it, it'll save those guys' arms if they don't pitch every fourth day. If they yeah. pitch every fifth or sixth day, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll save them. And sure enough, they won the pennant in the World Series. 1969. Right, right. In 69. Uh, and right. Siever says that's what saved them. He said, if I had to pitch 336 innings or something like that, he said, sure. he never would have made it. Never right. would have made it. Right. Uh, huh. Now, I, I'm, not sure, I didn't I'm not sure if I take that for gospel, but Branca yeah. claims that Hodges was, that was the innovator of the five days. Innovator of the five days. Wow, that's great. I don't Isn't know. That crazy? Either. I, yeah, it is crazy. And that's great. One more story, Ronnie. Yeah. It goes, I, got, I got one more story. Okay, good. All right. Uh, we all know the story, and I'm sure you do too, of Steve Garvey's father was the bus driver for the Dodgers in Vero Beach. During right. spring training, Garvey's old man was the, was the guy who drove their bus. So when they went to play all their exhibition games, Garvey Sr. was the guy. So, uh, of course, his son Steve – who later would become a great first baseman for the L.A. Dodgers, he asked uh, the club if his son could be a bat boy. And that's how Steve Garvey became a bat boy. Steve Garvey wrote a book about it, about uh-huh. being the bat boy for the Dodgers. There's a book out there. I bought it like a fool. It's a, it's a horrible book. It's, a, it's like aimed at eighth graders. I didn't know that, of course. I thought it was going to be a really great book. I bought the book. It was like an eighth uh, middle school book. But anyway... Sure. We all know that story. Steve Garvey, great first baseman for the Dodgers, started off being their bat boy because yeah. his father yeah. drove the bus. Well, here's a little known fact. Ralph okay. Branca had a buddy. Okay, Ralph Branca sold insurance, as you know, after he retired. Right. Okay, and uh, by the way, Bobby Thompson sold paper bags. Paper bags. That's what Bobby Thompson huh. did for a living after yeah. he quit baseball. Yeah. He sold paper uh, bags. Imagine the guys uh-huh. doing that today. Yeah, yeah. There's still that. guys that 
that sell paper bags. Absolutely. Okay, so Ralph That's Ralph Brenka is friends. Ralph <laughs> Ralph Brenka is friends with this guy who owns a bunch of racehorses. Okay. And and the guy the guy's name I, I'm not going to tell you his name right now. He knows this guy okay. who, who you know he, he he owns a bunch of racehorses that that ran in the Florida racetracks. Okay. So he's down in Florida. He went to Vero Beach. Franca used to go down there and coach a little and help out during spring training. Yeah. So he's down there. So his friend says to him, listen, he says, my son is a big baseball fan. And could you just please try to get him to be the bat boy for the Dodger home uh-huh. games here at Holman Stadium at Vero Beach? Franca uh-huh. says, sure. He goes over to Walter Olson and he says, can this kid – be the bad boy. Walter Wilson said, I don't care. Of course. Yeah, sure he can. Yeah. And guess who that kid was? Brian Cashman. No kidding. Who in 1998, who in 1998, at age 30, at age 30, became general manager of the New York Yankees and remains general manager of the New York Yankees to this very day. Today. That's right. That's amazing. Those those are the stories I came equipped to tell yeah. those are the stories i told i'm all out of bullets <laughs> they're great they're great thank you thank you I got a little let's I got take... a little off color joke i can tell you if you all right go ahead I, I think we can do this sure <laughs> this uh guy goes out to the racetrack you were talking about racetrack see so he's got a stopwatch and he's watching all the horses warm up so yep. he figures out he zeroes in on number four well, the poor guy, he's got a little speech impediment, and he stutters. So he goes to the window, and he says, give me a t- t- ticket, uh, uh, $100 on number four. That horse comes out of that gate like it's on fire, way ahead of everyone else. Halfway around the track, he turns his head to the right, comes over to the fence, uh, 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 all out of breath, all the horses pass him up, he comes in last. The guy is so mad, he could just scream. So three weeks later, he comes out again. He's got a stopwatch. He's out there to recoup. Number four is the horse. I might be not, but he's the fastest one around. So he goes to the window to uh, to recoup, and he says, uh, g- 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 give me a t- t- ticket to t- t- $200 on number four. That horse comes out of that gate way, way ahead of everyone else. Halfway around the track, he turns his head to the right, comes over to the fence. Uh, uh, uh. All the horses pass him up, he comes in last. The guy is just ready to spit bullets. So he, go, he goes down to the stables and finds the trainer of the horse. And he says, I, I know what's wrong with your horse. He says, what? He says, if you put, 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 put some lead in his left ear, it'll w- weight down his head, and he w- w- won't turn his head to the right, and he'll go, go straight ahead, and he'll win the race. The trainer says, that's a fabulous idea. Thank you. But how would you suggest that I put that uh, lead in his ear? He says, well, well with a f- f- fucking pistol. What? <laughs> 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 I didn't uh, see yeah. that one coming. That's funny. <laughs> Three hundred bucks. He says, "Shoot the damn horse." <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Is that funny? Yeah. That is funny. That is funny. <laughs> now let's get on a jet plane and go three thousand miles. Damn. Well, not for you. For me, it would be. <laughs> let's go out yeah. to the left coast. And before we hang up the uh, show tonight, let's gab a little bit about the twenty seventeen Los Angeles Dodgers. Well, they are amazing, uh, Peter. They are 88 and 35, 53 games uh, above 500. They're running away with the race right now. They have a couple of injuries. They put Cody, Cody Bellinger and Alex Wood on the disabled list today. Yeah. So uh, uh, Wood had a problem with his SC joint, and uh, Bellinger has a sprained ankle. So they brought up uh, Brock Stewart and Josh yeah, he's Raven. Pitch tonight. Yeah, right, right. But uh, I think it's, it's backdated a couple of days for Bellinger, so hopefully he'll come back soon. 
But yeah. the biggest news was they acquired this week uh, Curtis Granderson. The Grandy Man. Well, absolutely. Grandy Man, I love him. He, he's such a class act. I know him well. He uh, he was the uh, the host on the on the documentary about Jackie and I. It was called mm-hmm. Letters from Jackie. Yeah, and yeah, I met him several players. times. Yeah, just a wonderful guy. And he loved Jackie Robinson. And if you realize, he notices that he wears high socks, just yes. like Jackie did. Yep. And he said he does that to honor Jackie Robinson. I mean, he That's is great. such a class guy. He is, and he, he wrote a beautiful, uh, message to the Mets fans and thanked them for all the years. Um, and he's so excited to be in Los Angeles. Not only is he excited, but he's already hit two home runs, won a grand slam last night. Yeah, true. And, uh, he's just amazing. The Dodgers are doing well. They, they need Kershaw back. I think it won't be too long before they get him back. Um, and uh with wood on the on the on the DL right now, that's gonna make it a little tough too. I still think their pitching isn't as good as it is. They need they need another horse. Now uh Darvish is on the D L too. Yes he so is right now. So when those guys get back, then we're gonna have a solid team. I saw um, someone comment on I saw a comment on Facebook today saying, how can a major league team have five of their starters on the DL and be in first place by 20 and a half games? Right. Amazing. (laughs) Amazing. And I heard a statistic, but I don't remember what it was. How many wins and losses the Dodgers have had since Kershaw's um, on the DL? And it's tremendous. I don't remember the, the statistics, but it was a lot of it was a lot of games. It's almost like they are backing him up, you know. They're trying to fill in the yeah, hole. Yeah, they did that. They did that a few years ago when he went on the DL too. They yeah, played yes, very they well in his absence. Yeah. That only shows right. me one thing. That shows me that it's a balanced team. They're yeah. not. They're 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 not putting all their eggs in one basket. They're not saying, well, right. if Kershaw doesn't help us out, we're dead. They're not We're saying dead, that. Right. They never right. say that. They never say that. And uh, it's just, yeah, they they are. They're, they're like uh, nineteen and three or something since he's hurt. Yeah, it was amazing. 19, Twenty and four uh, or something like that. We're amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it really is. But um, and you the know, that they're they're go ahead. they are a balanced team. They are a balanced team. Sure. Um, and Granderson said that himself because he's a newbie. And he realized what's going on, and they never say die. No matter what they're yeah. losing, they keep coming back and coming back. I don't know how many games they they won where they were losing and came back. To oh, yeah. Them. But it's yeah. tremendous. It's just tremendous. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, the, the fans in L.A., who used to leave every game around the seventh inning, are staying the whole game now. Because yeah, they, know. they know that there's a chance that they're going to come back. Yep. So... It's pretty good. Yeah. It is more than pretty good. It's excellent, and I it's I just miss the hell. I miss the hell out of Vince Scully. I and, do. Uh, too. That's not a knock. That's not a knock on the new guy. Not a knock no. on the new guy. No. no. But uh, I miss Vince Scully like crazy because if they catch uh, if they capture magic in a bottle and they go all the way and they sweep right, right through the postseason, I'm really going to miss. Vin Scully in that locker room talking right. to them and interviewing them and explaining Absolutely. what we just saw, et cetera. It's going right. to be, it's going to be poignant, but, yeah, um, it will, it will be that as it may, it whatever happens, five, five to five happen. in the fourth inning right now. Okay. They're tied cool. five to five in the fourth inning in Pittsburgh. All right. Okay. Uh, so. I think that's about it, pal. What do you think? I think that's it. I think it's been a great show. And, oh yeah, uh, I liked it. I, lo- I love your stories about the old Brooklyn Dodgers. I love telling those Luke stories. Snyder's, they're so great. Oh, they're great. They're great. Just they're great. funny. They it was funny a fun story. day. A fun day. We had a great yep. show. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, well, partner. Thanks, Peter. I'll be talking it. to you. I'll be talking to you by uh, messenger and uh, text, and uh, right. we'll do the same thing next week. 
Thanks a lot for your help. And to all of our listeners, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.